Okay, let's talk about digestion. Maybe, if the slides will flip. There we go. Okay, so the primary purpose of the digestive tract is, of course, moving nutrients, water, um, electrolytes, things like that, from the inside of your GI tract to the inside of your blood. Your GI tract, you have to keep in mind, is technically an external environment. When you put something in your mouth, whether it's a marble or anything, and you swallow it, that thing, even though it goes into your mouth and down your esophagus and everything, and then into your stomach, it's still considered external environment. It's not internal environment. The blood, the interstitial fluid, those are internal environments, but not the hollow lumen of your GI tract. So you're trying to get things from that external environment to the internal environment. Get it to the blood, it could transport it everywhere. The next several slides are actually general descriptions or main things you want to watch all the way through this, this uh, set of lectures. So there are four basic processes that when you talk about any organ in the GI tract, you can look at these four things. How does it affect motility, or how does it control motility? What's it moving, in other words? What's it secreting, or what's it releasing? What's it digesting, which means breaking down the food? And then what's it absorbing? In other words, getting from the external to the internal environment. And I'll go through each of these four points again. But when we talk about the mouth, just gut instinct, no pun intended, motility in the mouth, what motility would you have? Chewing, yep, so mastication, and there's one other thing. You take your tongue, you push it to the roof of the mouth, and you push the food backward, which is swallowing. So you have a mixing motility with chewing. You have a propulsive motility with swallowing. It's the same idea in the stomach. The stomach's constantly grinding. You have three layers of muscle grinding at your food. That would be a mixing motility. It's moving the food, mixing it around. But then at the same time, it's taking a little squirt of food, one little bit at a time, pushing it into the small intestine, propelling it. So there's more than one type of motility, and those are the two types we'll talk about again and again and again. Next, you want to ask yourself what's secreted in your mouth. Again, what's secreted? Saliva, right? You know saliva comes out, and there are a lot of purposes for it, and we'll talk about those different things. So the secretions, whatever's moved from the internal environment to the external environment, whatever you're pushing into the GI tract. What do you think is secreted in the stomach, if you had to guess? Stomach acid, right? So some of these things... They're instinctive to you, and I always think this is interesting when people take things that are simple and they make them way too complex. Go with your gut. What's your gut tell you first, and then look at the little details. Next is digestion. What are you doing for digesting in the mouth? What do you think? You're chewing, but you're also doing a chemical digestion. You're actually breaking down things like carbs. And if you want to try this at, at home, take a, a saltine cracker. When you put it on your mouth, what's it taste like right away? Salt, right? Saltine. So if you hold it there for about 30 to 60 seconds, though, if you just let the saliva mix with it, the saliva will start digesting that cracker, and it'll actually release the carbs. It breaks the carbs apart into little simple components. What's it start tasting like? Sugars. Yeah, carbs are just big chains of sugars. So if you leave the saltine on long enough, it starts tasting sweet. And the fourth one, absorption. So what's being absorbed from the external to the internal environment? In your mouth, there are very few things that are actually absorbed in the mouth. Can you think of anything you absorb, you try and get into your bloodstream through the mouth? I bet you, you're all going to know what I'm talking about in just a second. Oh my god, my heart. Nitro pills, right? So they, they take them sublingually, they tuck them underneath their tongue, and they absorb it directly into the bloodstream. There are no nutrients absorbed there, there are no carbs or fats or anything absorbed in the mouth, but drugs can be. So the next time you're out drinking, and you take a shot, just let that vodka sit there a little bit. You'll actually absorb it faster in your blood. If you can handle the taste of it, right? So, like I said, every time we talk about an organ through the GI tract, look at these four points. What's the motility? What's the secretion? What's the digestion and the absorption? That's kind of the key to this section, are those four points. And if you're looking through your book, your textbook, you'll notice that the notes go right along with the textbook. So it talks about the four major processes, motility, absorption, secretion, and digestion. It talks about some little tips or things to watch for. All right, so motility first. You have to think about what's moving. What is moving things through the body? Muscle. It's a muscle. What type of muscle are you going to see mostly in the GI tract? Cardiac? No. Skeletal? Can you go, mmm, squeeze the food harder? No, you can't do that. You think, oh. I'll save you some vivid images here. I was going to say something like, can you think poop faster, but more descriptive. 
but you don't. And it's the same thing if you have diarrhea. You can't go, oh, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, right? It just moves right along. It's smooth muscle. It's involuntary. Okay, I did go there, right? So the tone, and we're talking about smooth muscle tone. You have a, a small level of contraction all the time. And when we talked about smooth muscle, I mentioned that too. When you die, your GI tract will actually lengthen out a couple feet longer than when you're alive. Because it's for the first time ever that it was able to relax. It always holds some tone. So when you're running for your life, you are moving food just a little bit. It's not nearly as fast as you would when you're relaxing. All right, the two types of motility you watch for, propulsive, which means you're moving things forward from one organ to the next to the next, so mouth to the esophagus to the stomach to the small intestine, large intestine, rectum, and then anus. Those are propulsive, moving it along. Mixing is when you're actually like grinding the food, you're smashing the food, or you're trying to wring the food out to absorb water out of it. Those are all mixing movements. Next is the secretion, so whatever you're adding to the GI tract. These are secretions that are coming from the blood, moving across the cell lining and into the stomach, or into the small intestine, or into the large intestine, or in the mouth. All the secretions that you have are actually borrowed from the plasma. What's borrowed telling you? It needs to be returned, unless you're my neighbor and my lawnmower, jackass. <laughs> Kidding. It's funny because I'm actually the one borrowing the, the lawnmower. But anyway, it's borrowed from the plasma, which means it needs to be returned. When you make saliva, that's actually fluid from your blood that's being moved across into the salivary gland, being turned into saliva, and then secreted out. Then you swallow that saliva, it gets down in the stomach and the small intestine, and gets reabsorbed back into the blood. It's just temporarily borrowed. It's on loan. So the secretions are borrowed things. When you release an enzyme, an enzyme is made out of proteins and amino acids. You had to borrow those amino acids from the blood, make the enzyme, release it into the external environment, then you push it down from, let's say, you release it into your stomach. Then it goes to the small intestine, and that enzyme is actually broken apart and reabsorbed. It's recycled. Your GI tract does a ton of recycling. Next is digestion, and what we're going to focus on is actually the chemical digestion, breaking down things into their simplest components. Because when you eat a Big Mac, you have the carbs, you have the proteins, you have the fats, but you can't actually absorb like any of those. You have to break them down into their simplest components. So a carbohydrate is a long string of, of sugars. So imagine this long piece of yarn. You have to take it and clip it into little tiny segments to be able to actually absorb or get that, get that into your system. You have to break it apart. Some carbohydrates you can't, like insoluble fibers, cellulose, you can't break that apart. No animal on the planet can. So you eat it and it goes through and basically scrapes your GI tract. You don't absorb it and it just cleans you out on the inside. It's like Drano for the human. All right, so carbohydrates. When we break apart carbohydrates, you're always going to break them down into a monosaccharide. They start as a poly. What's poly telling you? Many parts, right? Saccharide is just a fancy word for sugars. So here you start with a mini sugar structure, and you break it down into how many sugars? Monosaccharide. How many? One. So you start with this big thing. Like I said, it might be called glycogen. It might be called cellulose, which we actually can't break apart. Um, it can be starch. Those are three of the general terms for polysaccharides. And you break them down into monosaccharides, like glucose or galactose or fructose. Proteins, you can't absorb a whole protein. You have to break it down into little tiny components called amino acids. If you don't break down to the amino acids, you can't actually absorb it in your, in your blood. And then fats, we start with triglycerides, which implies that it's kind of a big structure. And then you bring it down to a monoglyceride again. And then individual free fatty acids. So here are some pictures. If you have this long chain, like I said, this long piece of yarn or long structure of carbohydrates, you need to break it down into simple components, mono components, to be able to absorb it. So you'll have enzymes, and kind of the key with enzymes, they usually end with the same three letters. What are you noticing? ACE, A-S-E. Yep, so amylase, sucrase, lactase, maltase. Typically, not always, but typically they'll tell you what they break down. So if you have something that's called maltase, it's there to break down maltose. How about lactase? What do you think is breaking apart? Lactose. Yeah. So this is a disaccharide. This is two sugars. That's not small enough. If you can't break this two sugar molecule down into a monosaccharide, you can't absorb it. So people that are lactose intolerant, they're missing this enzyme. They can't break that disaccharide apart. So can they absorb lactose? Nope. None of us can absorb lactose, but most of us actually have an enzyme that splits it apart for us. And then it breaks it down into smaller components. 
So once you break it into the monosaccharides, then you go into a process called absorption, which is the next process. But digestion is clipping things into smaller components. You can see even proteins start as long chains. So the proteins, you can clip into smaller chains, they're called peptides, but they're still the chain. And then eventually you break it down to something called amino acid. All of these things are like Legos. You just stack them one after another after another to build things. Like for instance, with proteins, when you eat amino acids, you stack them in your body to form what? Guess. Where's the primary storage place for proteins in your body? Muscle. Yeah, so you stack all these little amino acids into this long muscle component. And then, you know, if a lion eats you, a lion, what they do is they break all these big proteins down into little amino acids in their GI tract. They absorb it, and then it builds muscle for them. And then when they die, the vultures rip them apart, et cetera, et cetera. And then we go out vulture hunting and eat vultures, and the cycle just goes around. Akuna Matata. Isn't this year like the anniversary of that? Like the 30th anniversary or something? God, that made me feel old. Is it 20? 20? It still makes me feel old either way. I saw that in the theaters when it was brand new. And I wasn't a small child. Yeah. Okay, and then fats. And again, they start as triglycerides. So fats are kind of interesting. I always imagine that it has this glycerol hanger. So you've got this like coat hanger thing here at the very end, and it hangs three little pieces of fat off of it. But to absorb that efficiently, you have this enzyme called a lipase or a lipase. And that lipase goes in and breaks apart a what? A lip id, which is a fat. It goes in here and it breaks apart lipids and it breaks it into this clothes hanger with only one dangly chain and then two free fatty acids. Once you've broken down these simple components, then you can absorb that. Right. So speaking of absorption, absorption is just getting everything from the lumen, the hollow core of the GI tract, into the blood. Your ultimate goal is to get into the blood. If you don't get into the blood, it's worthless to you. It just follows all the way through your GI tract and then you poo it out. Okay, so which one is not a primary physiological function of the GI tract? So in other words, what's one of these, which one of these things is not what every organ in the GI tract will do? It's excretion, yeah. Excretion doesn't happen until the very end. So. Number one, what should be on here? What's the fourth one that's missing? Secretion, <laughs> absorption, motility, and digestion. Right, so that's the first major concept. And you want to keep that in mind all the way through. So let's walk through the anatomy real quick. Here's your anatomy review. The alimentary canal is one continuous tract. It's like a, I always hated this term, but a tube within a tube. Basically, you have this long tube. It starts at your mouth, goes all the way weaving, winding all the way down until it, whatever it is drops out your anus. Right? So from one end to the other, it's one long, continuous tube. There are no breaks. Why do you not want any breaks in this tube? Because you can get infections, right? So if there are any breaks, you get infections. Even when the tube branches off and goes to like the liver or the pancreas, there's no break inside the pancreas. It's still a continuous tube. It just weaves up in and through the liver and the pancreas. Right. So you know the major structures. And by the way, all of these major structures we call primary structures, if you were to swallow that marble, the marble actually goes into every one of these organs. So the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, and then out through the anus. Anything that's considered accessory organ is something that's part of the GI tract, but the marble never goes into it, like the teeth. The teeth will chew on the marble, but the marble will never get inside the teeth. The tongue will try and compress the marble, but it never gets inside the tongue. Salivary glands try and help release saliva onto the marble, but the marble never goes in. Same with the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. These help with digestion, but the actual food never goes inside of them. Okay, term lumen. Lumen means the hollow core of any organ. So the blood vessels, if there's no blood in it, it's in a hollow core. That's called the lumen in there. Uh, the GI tract, the hollow core is the lumen. The uterus, the hollow empty part on the inside of the uterus, that's the lumen. The urethra, the hollow empty core, is the lumen. So a lumen is just a term for the empty hollow center of any kind of a tube stru tube-like structure in the body. All right, and again, that's considered external environment. So anything that's in the lumen is external. Your whole purpose is to do what process getting it to the internal? 
What's the process that takes things from external to internal environment? Absorption. What's the process of making things small enough to absorb? <coughs> Digestion. What's the process of moving things? Motility. Yeah. All right. Next, anatomy-wise, the four layers, and this is a general overview. But if you start here at the very center of the lumen, and you start working your way into the body, the first layer that you come up to is the mucosa. Guess what it releases a lot of? Mucus. Yep. So it helps lubricate, helps provide fluids. The mucosa layer is an epithelial layer. It's a superficial covering. You slough this off every couple days. Just like your skin, you're constantly sloughing off layers, except it actually sloughs off faster than the skin. This stuff turns over really, really quick. That's why when you hear about something like a, a cancer in the GI tract, it's bad news because this cancer reproduces fast, just like the lumen does, or the wall of the lumen, the mucosa. Next is the submucosa. Guess where it's at? Under the mucosa, yeah. So actually I have a little bit more detailed picture here. You have the mucosa and then you just go a little bit below and you have the submucosa. And the submucosa is full of blood vessels, lymphatics. It's just like your skin. The superficial layer of your skin is avascular, which means it has what? Or is missing what? Avascular. Without blood vessels. It's the same idea with the mucosa. There are no blood vessels in the epithelial layer of the mucosa. The submucosa is packed with blood vessels, um, nerves run through it to help control it and regulate it. Lymphatics. The next layer is the muscularis. Guess what that's full of? Muscle. Yep. So you have typically have two layers of muscle in this muscularis layer. And the stomach is an exception because it has three. And we'll talk about that when we come into detail. But usually you have these two layers, a circular layer and a longitudinal layer. Circular layers are like a ring that goes around it. The longitudinal goes the length. So that when you squeeze things, you can smash it like this, but you can also inchworm it or propel it going this way. So it's constantly going, propelling and mixing, propelling and mixing. That's what the two layers are for. And then the next layer is the serosa. And the serosa is like a smooth, protective outer layer. It actually helps lubricate the inside of the abdominal cavity. So if you have your, your GI tract, and if you've dissected a person or a cat or whatever you dissected in anatomy, when you looked at the small intestines, they actually just weave over each other. That outer layer of the serosa helps keep it fluid-like so it can wiggle across each other. As you're pushing food, they can keep moving and grinding and propelling things. You don't want it stuck down. And that's a problem. A lot of surgeons don't like to do abdominal surgeries because if you cut into any of this tissue, what, what's it create? A scar. It creates scarring. And the scar can actually glue two areas together and it doesn't move very well. Um, endometriosis is a really good example of this. With endometriosis, the lining of the uterus actually goes up into the abdominal cavity and then every month when it's stimulated by estrogen it grows and then it becomes scar tissue and then it grows and becomes scar tissue every month and starts, starts gluing down her internal organs so if you didn't know that there's a scary fact for you All right so the four layers you have the mucosa the submucosa the muscularis and the serosa and this is continuous all the way down so if I ask you which is the correct order from inside to outside of the digestive tract, so think lumen to the internal environment. So which one's the correct order? What should be the first layer? Mucosa. And then what's underneath the mucosa? submucosa so right away you can see which number would it be the only possible answer so far is number two yeah okay digestion regulators so things to control digestive tract there are actually four you're going to look at and you're going to subdivide them mentally into what's intrinsic and what's extrinsic what does intrinsic mean if i'm talking about the gi tract what's controlling the gi tract intrinsically the gi tract if I'm talking about the GI tract, what would extrinsic probably be referring to? Brain or endocrine system? Yep, so nervous system and endocrine system. All right, so here are the four. First, autonomous. What's that telling you right away? Autonomous means it's, it's controlling itself, right? So would this be intrinsic or extrinsic? Intrinsic, yep. Autonomous smooth muscle function. It's telling you intrinsic control. 
you put food in the GI tract and its, its instinct is it needs to move the food. So it's gonna control itself. It says, you know, if you have a lot of food in the stomach, it's gonna start moving the stomach, smashing the food, propelling the food forward into the small intestine. This autonomous smooth muscle is just like when we talk about pacemaker cells of the heart. It's, you have these things called interstitial cells of Cahal and they form this thing called the basic electrical rhythm. Your, the way I always imagine it is that your GI tract has this impulse going down all the time. It's going zoop, 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 and it's constantly seeing this electrical surge down along the, the small intestine and down along the large intestine. What's interesting is that that surge actually slows down the further it gets. It moves fast up at the beginning of the small intestine, but it goes slower down at the end. And it's called the basic electrical rhythm. It's always running. Next is the intrinsic nerve plexus. This is kind of interesting. The nervous system is actually the brain, the spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system. But there's a special set of nerves that are exclusive to the GI tract, and they're called the intrinsic nerve plexuses. These run without the brain or spinal cord's control. They're intrinsic. So since they're part of the GI tract, we call it the enteric. When you see enteric, I always think intestines. It looks very similar. So the enteric nervous system system's talking about the intestinal nervous system. And there are two halves of it. There's the myenteric plexus and the submucosal plexus. My enteric is referring to the muscle Remember, myo refers to muscle. Enteric is talking about the intestines. So it's the muscle of the intestines. And there's another one called the submucosal, or submuco uh, submucous plexus. Where would the submucosal plexus be? What layer? In the submucosa, right? So it kind of tells you. Here's the muscle layer, and there's the mucus layer. So when the muscles stretch, the muscle can talk to the submucosal layer and say, hey, you know what? We're stretching. We're going to be cranking up a little bit. You need to start excreting more enzymes to break down the food. They talk to each other. They don't have to talk to the brain. These are both intrinsic. They're in the GI tract controlling the GI tract. You put a bunch of food in your stomach, like you try and drink a gallon of milk, the myenteric plexus says, this is way too much, and it starts saying, we're going to contract. Your brain didn't have to be involved with that. It's just going to do it instinctively. The next two are extrinsic. So extrinsic nerves and then the GI, or sorry, gastrointestinal hormones. So extrinsic nerve is talking about what system? the nervous system, right? The intrinsic ones are talking about the nerves inside the GI tract. Extrinsic means it's controlled by something outside. Your brain sends a signal down. If it's a sympathetic pathway, what's the, what's the sympathetic pathway going to tell your GI tract to do? Speed up or slow down? Slow down. It's saying, we need to run for our life right now. Digesting and absorbing food is not a priority. So sympathetic slows down. What's the name of the neurotransmitter that's going to be released to slow down? norepinephrine. And then the parasympathetic, of course, is associated with rest and digest, so what's it going to do to the GI tract? Speed it up. What's the hormone, or hormone, neurotransmitter involved there? Acetylcholine, ACH. So again, tests are not cumulative, but the concepts are cumulative. If you, you, if you remember the stuff from the nervous system, you already knew sympathetic is associated with norepinephrine and epinephrine. Parasympathetics associated with acetylcholine. You know right away what those neurotransmitters are, and they'll come back. And then GI hormones. Hormones right away tells you it's what system? Endocrine. It's not the GI tract. It's actually an endocrine system within the GI tract. So it's endocrine system controlling the GI tract. In fact, you can release um, adrenaline from the adrenal gland, endocrine gland, dump it in the blood. It goes to the GI tract and tells the GI tract to slow down. Endocrine. So there were the four controllers or regulators, and we'll talk about them in better detail as we need them again. They'll come back. So regulation of the digestive system includes all of the following except which one doesn't belong. where 30 seconds just keeps getting longer and longer. Okay, so how about 
gastrointestinal hormones, do they regulate the digestive tract? Yes, I put a little Y by that. How about enteric nervous system, does that? Yes, I put a Y by that. How about the basic exit response? Well, why not? It's supposed to be the basic electrical rhythm. When I see basic exit response, I think that somebody's pulling the plug and poo just falls out. It's, it seems wrong. Just thinking about it seems wrong. So I'm going to put an N by number three, and then number four, autonomic nervous system. Yeah, sympathetic and parasympathetic. So that one's a yes. The one that doesn't belong is that basic exit response. All right, the wall of the digestive tract contains three types of sensory receptors. And remember, so now we're talking about how the nervous system is being involved. You have to have a receptor to detect things. You have chemoreceptors to detect what? Chemicals. Yep, it'll detect different chemicals, like glucose and sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium. It'll detect those things. It'll detect levels of proteins and amino acids. Those are chemicals. Mechano is detecting what? some kind of a physical change. So in this situation, it's stretch primarily. Mechanoreceptors are detecting, detecting stretch. So is there no stretch or is there no pushing? Like is your stomach empty and it's just flopping around there? Or is there a lot of tension inside of it? Mechanoreceptors detect that. Like when we talked about baroreceptors for blood pressure before, those are a type of mechanoreceptors. They're detecting pressure. These mechanoreceptors, same idea, they're detecting stretch. And the third one are osmoreceptors. What are they detecting? Water concentration, right? Not just the presence of water, but the concentration. It's kind of the idea of, is it a good idea if you're stranded on a life raft in the ocean to start drinking the water around you? No, you're getting lots of water in, but the osmolarity of that water is totally wrong. So you'll actually, it'll kill you. It'll suck the water out of you instead of actually putting water into your blood. Osmoreceptors detect the concentration of the water. So what's the percentage of water to solutes? And it doesn't matter what the solute is. Is it a protein solute or sugar solute or salt solute? It doesn't matter. Osmo is referring to percentage of water or concentration of water. It's not just the presence of water. All right? Reflexes, so remember, those receptors are always the beginning of some kind of a neural pathway. In this situation, we have reflexes. If you stretch, let's say, in the stomach, if I stretch the stomach really quick and it triggers these mechanoreceptors and also the, the muscle itself, what are the mechanoreceptors going to say? This is too much. We need to stretch back, right, or snap back. So start compressing. Um, it's the same idea with if, you're, if you take something that's an irritant, and you take this irritant in like cinnamon, right? Anybody ever tried to do the tablespoon of cinnamon before? Sucker. So if they get that in and it's lying, it's lying the um, esophagus and the back of the pharynx, the receptors back there are going to say, hey, there's an irritant. What's it going to make them want to do? Right? It's going to send a signal up the medulla oblongata and back, and it's going to tell them either vomit or cough or do something to get rid of that. A short reflex doesn't leave the GI tract is kind of the key. A long reflex does. A long reflex sends a signal all the way up to the brain or spinal cord and it comes all the way back. So those two examples, which one was a short reflex? The stomach being full and making you vomit or the cinnamon that's sending a signal to the brain stem and back? Which one's a short reflex? It's the stomach that's controlling the stomach. It, the signal doesn't have to leave the GI tract. That stretch stays in the enteric nervous system, in the GI tract, and it does all the control there. Your brain doesn't even have to be involved in that. The long reflex goes all the way up to the medulla oblongata. Your medulla oblongata has to be intact for this to work. All right, so short reflex stays in the GI tract, long reflex goes all the way out. And of course, there's a graph in the book, so if you like pictures, here they are. So local changes in the GI tract trigger those receptors. They can release a hormone in the GI tract and stay in the GI tract. Would that be a long or short reflex? If the hormone is released in the GI tract and stays in the GI tract. It's short. What if the receptors in the GI tract go all the way up to the brain stem and come back? That's long. What if the, they trigger a nervous pathway intrinsically and it goes from the stomach to the stomach to do the controlling? That would be short. So just look. Is it leaving? Is the signal leaving and coming back? If it's leaving and coming back, 
then it's long. If it stays in the GI tract, it's short. There are ways to do long endocrine loops by where's most endocrine chemicals travel in the blood. Yes, yeah, so you can actually send a long signal up and around. You could bring in something in the GI tract. It could uh, trigger stretch reflex, which says, hey, you need to digest something. A hormone can be released into the blood that goes over to the pancreas and tells the pancreas to release a chemical to help digest food. So it's going from GI tract to the blood back to the GI tract. Would that be short or long? GI tract, blood, GI tract. It's long. If it's GI tract to GI tract, it's short. It's kind of the easiest way to remember it. Short means that the signal stays in the GI tract to do the controlling. All right, so that's regulation. Those are all the main points of regulation. As we go into each of the organs, I'll keep bringing those points back. So, so far, it's kind of a, a preview of what we're going to be talking about. Now we're going to go one organ at a time. And to me, one of the best ways to study for the GI tract is you just look at one organ and learn what four things about it. How does it control its motility? How does it control its secretions? How does it control its digestion? And how does it control its absorption? So as we go through, you're going to watch. As I talk about each organ, we're going to plug in each of those. We're going to go into better detail than just saying, hey, it moves food forward. We're going to talk about how it moves food forward. What's the name of the process for moving food forward? What's the regulator that's working to move it forward? OK, so the mouth is the first one, of course. That's the entry of the digestive system. And in the anatomy, when you're looking at saliva, what of those four categories will that fall into? Secretion. So right away, we're going to talk about the secretion. You put something in. In fact, you don't even have to put something in your mouth. You can automatically start secreting before you have any contact with the food. If you like lemons, yesterday, actually, I pulled out, I had a Meyer lemon in my refrigerator, and it was really cold, almost to the point where it was almost frozen. But I pulled it out, and I took a knife, and I sliced it, and the, juice, the cold juice just started running down onto the tray. When I picked it up, it was running all over my fingers. And I love that, because you can slice the little pieces, and the juice is there. And imagine just putting it up to your mouth and biting into the lemon. Just thinking about it makes you start doing what? Salivating. So secretion can happen before you even put food in your mouth. By the way, what's controlling that? Is that intrinsic or, ex intrinsic or an extrinsic control? Thinking about that lemon. Where's the signal coming from that makes you salivate? From the brain, right? So it's a long pathway. You think about it, you have this cortical control up here, and then your gut instinct starts to make you salivate. It's like thinking about chocolate cake, right? I always start drooling. I have to wear a bib when I think of chocolate cake. But the secretions of saliva can be intrinsically with a baby, all it takes, babies don't know what lemons are, right? They have no clue. So showing a baby a lemon doesn't do anything for them. But as soon as it gets in their hands, what do they do with the lemon? They put it on their mouth, right? And as soon as it makes contact, they start salivating. Give them just a regular ball. Balls don't taste like anything really, right? So if they put the ball up through the mouth, what do they start doing? S salivating all over. That is just because of touch, right? It's just touch on the tongue makes you start salivating. All right, so what's in saliva? There are a couple of chemicals you have to know. First one's called salivary amylase. What's it telling you it is? It's an enzyme. And if you remember, amylase breaks down carbohydrates. It was in that picture before when we talked about like maltase, lactase, sucrase. There was one enzyme called amylase that breaks down polysaccharides. All those other ones broke down disaccharides, just two sugar components. But amylase breaks down polysaccharides. When you put that cracker on your mouth, Amylase comes out and just starts breaking apart starches. It's breaking it into little tiny sugars so you can start tasting it. So after this, even though saliva is a secretion, what is amylase doing? What other process is amylase doing? Motility, digestion, secretion, or absorption. Digestion. Amylase is the first step in digestion. Another component of saliva is mucus, and mucus is a thick substance. Thick and sticky. When you're hungry, you release a watery mucus. When you're afraid, you release a thick mucus. When you're hungry, what system is telling you to release watery mucus? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? When you're hungry, what system is kicking in? Parasympathetic. Makes you release this watery mucus. 
when you're afraid, your mouth feels sticky and dry, but it's not dry. It's actually just so much thick mucus being released that you're like, what do you want to do? Put some water in there to, to dilute it. So mucus is another component, and we'll talk about that again in just a little bit. The next one's lysozyme. We talked about this the first week of class. What was it? Actually, first, where, was, where did you find lysozyme the first week of class? In a lys... Azome, right? It's the chemical, it's the enzyme inside the lysosome that breaks apart things like bacteria. It helps digest things inside the cell. So what do you think it's going to do for your mouth? It's going to act like an antimicrobial, right? It's going to act like an antimicrobial. It's going to try and kill the bacteria that's living on your teeth or the viruses that get inside your mouth. So there are three major components of saliva. Amylase for digestion, mucus to lubricate, and then lysozyme is an antimicrobial. And then there you can see the function. So this saliva acts as a solvent to help digest, to dilute things. You chew your food, you introduce fluids to it to help make it more liquidy. Helps you with speech, oral hygiene, like killing bacteria. And it's also rich in bicarbonate. Have you seen that word before? Yep. Remember, that was the transport form of carbon dioxide. Bicarbonate is also just a general alkaline substance in your body. So when your body needs a base or an alkaline, it releases bicarbonate. It's easily made with carbon dioxide and water. What's it trying to do? What's bicarbonate doing then? It's trying to neutralize acids in your mouth. When you have bacteria that are breaking down foods, like when you eat anything, you have little pieces of food left in there. The bacteria starts digesting it and making it very acidic which leads to what if you don't get rid of it? Cavities. So bicarbonate helps prevent tooth decay. And then the salivary glands, you have three major salivary glands. This is not anatomy, so we're not gonna go through it again, but I love the little ones underneath the tongue, sublingual ones that make it gleek. Does anybody use that term? Yeah. Gleek. Ugh, it's gross. Just thinking about it. Since I was a boy, of course, if you couldn't gleek, you were nobody in eighth grade, right? And then saliva continued, so it's continuous. You're always salivating in your sleep, even when you fall asleep in here. You have that puddle of drool coming out. Every day you release about one to two liters. I love visualizing things. When you talk about liters, a two liter, two liter bottle of soda, that's how much saliva you produce in a day. Hopefully you swallow most of it, but that's how much you're making. So if you just hung a bottle outside of your mouth all day, you'd fill that sucker in a day. Way cool. Now my mind's going to people that do uh, chewing tobacco and spit in soda bottles. Ugh. I remember my brother drank that one time when we were a kid. He didn't know. I had an uncle that, did, that would chew and spit into a Pepsi bottle and it looked like Pepsi. Yeah, disgusting. But it was him, not me. Alright, salivary center. This is, salivary is necessary for life. You have to salivate. Otherwise, have you ever tried eating something when you have a dry mouth? Try eating crackers, like a bunch of crackers at one time. How easy is that to swallow? If you didn't have saliva, it'd be almost impossible to swallow food and you'd starve to death. So what part of the brain controls life-dependent functions? Medulla oblongata, again, right? When you're getting ready to vomit, what happens to your saliva? Oh my god, just imagine it, right? The last time that you vomited, how'd you start feeling? You're like, uh, drooling really bad? So disgusting. I have vomited three times in my life that I can ever recall, and all three are vivid. And I just remember that feeling, that just like the tingling in the back of your mouth and you start salivating really bad. Nasty. Um, and no, they weren't all alcohol induced, thank you. So acquired or conditioned salivary reflex without oral stimulation. So this is the one, conditioned means you did what with it? You learned it. The lemon is the example. You learned what a lemon was, and then next time you salivate. You learn what chocolate cake is. I can start talking about chocolate cake and describing it, and you'll start, your stomach might start grumbling. That's a learned or a conditioned response. It's a reflex, but it's learned. Kind of like when we talked about the Bensky reflex. And then simple or unconditioned. Simple means what? You are born with it. Yep, it came. Babies, you put anything in their mouth, and they start salivating all over the place. Right? They stick their fingers in their mouth, they start drooling down their arm. 
So anytime that the chemoreceptors, like you put a little sugar or a little salt on the tongue, something that stimulates the chemoreceptors or pressure receptors by touching your, or squeezing on the tongue, you start salivating as an instinct. All right. So presence of food or actually anything. And I'm going to skip over the graph. All right, next about the mouth. Autonomic influences on salivation, and I already said this once, but I'm telling you again. Autonomic's telling you sympathetic and parasympathetic. Which one makes you produce mucus and saliva? Both of them. They both do. What did I tell you about this parasympathetic? It makes what kind of mucus? A thick, sticky, or a wet mucus? It's a wet, slippery one. It's there to lubricate the passageway for food to come in. Sympathetic is releasing a thick sticky, and I have no idea what the physiological benefit of that is. But when you do public speaking and you're afraid of it, when your mouth gets dry and sticky, it's actually because you're, you're salivating, but there's very little water in the saliva. It's mostly just that thick, sugary mucus. And that's why you want to take drinks every once in a while to try and dilute it a little bit. What's mastication? That's a big fancy word for chewing. chewing. What would that be? Would that be... A motility, absorption, digestion, or secretion? It's primarily motility. Yeah, it does help break down food, but it doesn't chemically break it down. It physically breaks it into smaller pieces, but not small enough. It never breaks it small enough for you to actually absorb. So we're going to stick mastication in a motility. Would it be propulsive or mixing mot motility? It's mixing. Mastication is chewing. You're mixing your food. That's why you're supposed to chew thoroughly to mix the food before you swallow it. What's that B word for that wad of food now? It's a bolus. Yeah. And then digestion. What was the name of the chemical that starts digesting in the mouth? Start with an A. Amylase. Salivary amylase. Yep. That starts carbohydrate digestion. For you to break down things like starches. Carbs are really interesting. If you ever take a, like a, um, what am I, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Crap. It's a biology course, but it talks about the breakdown of chemicals. I can't believe I'm actually, biochemistry. Wow, I'm an idiot. So if, if you take a biochemical course, it's really interesting looking at the different types of carbohydrates. You have three that you take in. You take in glycogen when you eat an animal. That's easy to break down. You take in starch when you eat a plant. That's also very easy to break down. But you also take in cellulose, which is so tightly woven, no animal on the planet can break it down. Not even termites. Termites that eat wood can't break cellulose. They actually have to have a bacteria in their gut to break it apart. But digestion is chemically breaking apart these different things. Next is absorption, and you absorb no nutrients. Can you absorb anything in the mouth? Yes. Some drugs and alcohol. So some drugs and alcohol. If the, if the drug is lipid-loving, it'll get absorbed. Alcohol loves lipids, easily absorbed in the mouth. It's interesting. You can absorb alcohol all over your body. Uh, I think it was like some Scandinavian country, there was a huge ordeal because um, teenage girls were actually dipping tampons in vodka and then inserting them before they went to class, and they were getting drunk. Nobody, you didn't hear about that? It's crazy. Yeah, so you can actually absorb alcohol all over the place. You can hold the alcohol in your mouth, hold it, hold it, hold it, and spit it out, and you'll start, get, you'll start actually absorbing it through your mouth without even having to swallow it. Okay, so no nutrients, no proteins, no carbs, no fats, no nucle nucleic acids, only things like lipid-loving alcohols. Okay, so which of the following is false about the mouth? What's not true about the mouth? How about number one? Is the secretion saliva? Looks good to me. How about the digestion is the beginning of carbohydrate dig digestion? What's the name of the A word that does carb digestion? Amylase. And we're going to see that A word again later. It's salivary amylase when it's in the mouth, but it's pancreatic amylase when it comes from what? Million dollar question. All right, the pancreas. Number three, so motility is chewing. Yeah, there's another motility, in fact. What do you think the second motility is that's propulsive? 
swallowing. We just haven't talked about it yet. How about absorption as proteins? Absorption is no nutrients, right? No nutrients. So if it's a protein, carb, fat, or nucleic acid, which are all nutrients, it doesn't get absorbed there. Number four is our correct answer, which is the only false one. Deglutition is the fancy word for swallowing. And I don't think this is actually in your notes like this. So over to the left side, or right side of your, your notes packet, you can write these down as I go through them. So these are the stages of deglutition, or stages of swallowing. There are three of them. The first one's voluntary. This is when you take, and here's what you want to remember. You take the tongue and push it to the roof of the mouth. So when you swallow, the voluntary stage is you take the tongue, push it to the roof of the mouth, and then you push the food back towards the soft palate. So the roof of the mouth, and then back to the soft palate. The next thing that happens is, what's that little dangly thing in the back? The uvula, right? So the uvula is going to shift up. This is the next stage. As you push the food back, the uvula shifts up, and it blocks food from going where? To the nose, the nasopharynx, technically, but up into the nasopharynx and the nose. It's blocking food from going up. It's trying to direct the food to make sure it's going to go down. So those are the major steps. You push the tongue to the roof of the mouth, forcing the food back to the soft palate, and the uvula shifts up, directing the food downward, blocking food from going in the nasopharynx. That's voluntary. You don't have to do that. You can chew, 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 and then do what? Blech. Spit it out, right? You don't have to swallow. It's a voluntary motion. However, once you get food back into the pharynx, what do they call the pharynx right behind the mouth? The oropharynx, right? Nasopharynx is behind the nose. Oropharynx is behind the mouth. So once food actually hits the back and the pharynx, once it hits that back wall, you're committed. Why are you committed now? There's no turning back. Because you've just flipped up the uvula and blocked you from doing what? You can't pull anything else in through the mouth, and now you can't pull anything in through the nose, what are you not able to do? Breathe. What part of your brain is going to kick in now to make sure that you are definitely going to be able to breathe again? The medulla oblongata. If it's life dependent, it's the medulla oblongata. So the main deglutition center is in the medulla oblongata. See how important it is when I made that joke about having a nail gun hit you in the medulla oblongata? It turns everything off. All these things you need for life, it shuts everything off. doesn't matter how good your whole brain is. You lose the medulla, you lose the life. All right, so as you start shifting backwards, now you're going to start doing things that are involuntary. Once the receptors on the back of the pharynx, mechanoreceptors, detect the presence of anything there. Once those mechanoreceptors are stimulated, the signal goes to the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata sends a signal back that makes you close up the epiglottis, right? Epiglottis is that little flap. It's like a leaf that goes over what structure? Does it cover the esophagus or the larynx? It covers the larynx. What's the layperson term for the larynx? Nobody knows. It's the voice box, right? Where your vocal cords are at. What's it sit on top of? What's that long tube of cartilaginous rings? It sits on top of the trachea. So air flowing in, you had the nose, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and then down into the larynx, the trachea, and then the bronchi. But you want to prevent it from getting down into that airway, so you need to take the epiglottis and you cover the larynx. That's one step. Another one that's not on here that you should write down is that in the larynx itself, your vocal cords that look kind of like this, they go blah, 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 and they quiver when you talk, they snap shut. They snap shut. So now you have the epiglottis closing over and the vocal cords are shut. Why would the vocal cords shut? Just in case the epiglottis doesn't close completely. You ever drank water too fast and the water actually gets down before the epiglottis gets to closed? What do you start doing? You start violently coughing, right? You're, <coughs> you're hacking. Usually you're lucky because the vocal cords shut in time and the water is actually sitting on top of the vocal cords telling them Holy crap, get the water out before it goes into the lungs. So you violently cough, blowing air up and trying to get it back out. If the water actually gets down in your lungs, then you've got big, big problems. All right, so close the epiglottis and it closes the vocal cords. This is an involuntary stage, and we call it the oropharyngeal stage because it's going from the mouth into the pharynx. 
Now the food's moving down. Now the food's all the way down. It's going to shift into the what? It's not going into the larynx or the trachea. It's going into the esophagus. So there's one muscle here. It's called the upper esophageal sphincter. Guess how you can locate this thing? It's at the top of the esophagus, right? It's called the upper esophageal sphincter. It relaxes. Medulla oblongata tells it relax. It opens up. It's normally closed so the air doesn't go down in your stomach. If you were, I don't know about girls, but when, as a boy, you learned that if you drank soda fast enough and you took a big like gulp of air with it, you could get lots of air in your stomach and you could do what better? You could like belch the alphabet. It's awesome. But you tricked it. You opened that upper esophagus, uh, esophageal sphincter long enough to push air down in there and we get in the stomach and then of course you could burp it back up. So this is called the pharyngeoesophageal phase and that's involuntary also. Right. The movement to get the food down is called peristalsis or peristaltic contractions. So this is definitely a word you want to write down or a term you want to write down. And I'll show you a picture of how it works. It's actually a really cool process. Your smooth muscle, it's not one ring after another. It's actually a continuous ring. So it's almost like it squeezes at the top and it just pu keeps pushing the food all the way down until it drops into your stomach. It's like when you empty a toothpaste tube. If you did all one smooth motion, you'd squeeze the top of the tube and you'd start just squeezing all the way down. That's peristalsis until all the, food or all the toothpaste is squeezed out at the end of the tube. Same idea with your, your esophagus. It just squeezes from the top and pushes the food. What's that food called, by the way? bolus and push the bolus all the way down. Right. So here's how it's written inside of your notes. But I just rewrote it to break it down into three stages so it was a little bit different. Right. So during the oropharyngeal stage of swallowing, the food is prevented from entering the wrong passageways because of the tongue, the uvula, the epiglottis, and the vocal folds. Collectively, all those things have to work in sync. Tongue pushes food to the top of the mouth and back. Uvula blocks it from going into the nose. Epiglottis blocks it from going into the larynx. And then the vocal cords, which are in the larynx, snap shut. So that just in case, it's like a secondary safety area. And then the pharyngeal muscles start contracting, forcing the bolus into the esophagus, and then the esophagus kicks in. This is what we refer to as an all or none reflex. You either get it all the way through, or you get none of it. What's interesting is that if you can't get the food down, guess what the food has to do? Come back up, right? You can test this once you leave this class, go outside, stick your finger as far as you can back into your pharynx, right? If you can get that back there and tickle the pharynx, guess what happens? The medulla will say, whoa, we've got to swallow this thing. Whatever it is, we need to swallow it now. So it'll try swallowing your finger. Can it swallow your finger? No, so you, got, you get like two or three of those, oh, 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 and then what happens? It tries to clear everything. It just relaxes all the muscles in your throat. It starts squeezing the stomach and tries to force everything back up. So it's actually a really beautiful process that has an ugly outcome. All right, so all or none. And here are the pictures. So there you've got the little bolus. You start swallowing by pushing the tongue to the roof of the mouth. You're pushing the food back. The uvula will shift up. The epiglottis here will fold down. What's going to happen to the vocal cords? They snap shut. Yep. So you can see the vocal cords here. Oh, I guess there's an open picture. But you can see looking down in how they snap shut. And again, it's just like having your fingers spread apart. They just snap together. So that if anything gets in there, you can try and cough it back up quickly. And then once it gets in past the upper esophageal sphincter, which is controlled by the medulla oblongata, the bolus just gets squeezed. Like I said, like toothpaste. You squeeze here and just keep squeezing it down, 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 down until the lower esophageal sphincter opens up. And the lower esophageal sphincter you would have in your notes somewhere too. They also call that the cardiac sphincter. Or the gastroesophageal sphincter. It's special. It has three names. And it's probably, those are probably three names you want to get familiar with because there are common disorders that are associated with the cardiac sphincter, which is the lower esophageal sphincter, which is also the gastroesophageal sphincter. Gastroesophageal is telling you it's between what two structures? Gastro is referring to stomach, and esophageal is referring to the esophagus. So this sphincter down here, sphincter, by the way, is a round ring of muscle, and it usually stays shut. 
sphincters like to stay shut until they're told to relax and then they open up for food to pass or whatever substance to pa pass through. Why would you normally want this one shut to prevent, yeah, flow of acidy stomach contents up into the esophagus? The esophagus is not an acidic environment. It's very neutral. In fact, its only secretion is just mucus. It doesn't absorb. It doesn't digest. Its motility is what? P word. Peristalsis. So there you had the four things for the esophagus, by the way. Peristalsis for motility. The only secretion is mucus for lubrication. But there's no digestion and there's no absorption in there. So if acid comes back up in here, it will start eroding away at the esophag esophagus. And they call it esophageal erosion. Anybody know the four letters for the name of the disease that you have if that happens? G-E-R-D, gastroesophageal reflux disorder. Okay. It's acids start coming back up. Other than people that have problems relaxing that sphincter or, or tightening that sphincter, who else gets erosion of their esophagus? You usually see the esophagus and the teeth start eroding. Bulimics, yeah. Because they're forcing that acidic stu substance up the wrong way. It's not meant to be that acidic. In fact, in your mouth, you have bicarbonate to neutralize acids, but there's no way you make enough to neutralize stomach acids. Okay, so the esophagus was the next one. And again, the paraesophageal sphincter prevents air from going through. So, or sorry, pharyngeal esophageal sphincter. That's the upper esophageal sphincter. Peristaltic waves move the food down. So, oops. So again, I was showing you a squeeze here, squeeze here, and it just keeps pushing the food down. And then the gastroesophageal sphincter is what closes to prevent reflux. And then your only secretion is mucus. So if I asked you a question like this, during swallowing, which one of the following has to happen? What has to happen during swallowing? number one, does it have to happen? Epiglottis covers over the esophagus. Yes or no? Does the epiglottis move during swallowing? Yes. Does it cover the esophagus? No. What's it cover? The larynx. It covers the larynx. So number one's wrong. If you cover, if you're swallowing and you covered the esophagus, what's the problem? You're going to swallow it right into your lungs, right? You want the food to go into the esophagus, so you should not be covering the esophagus. You should be opening it up. Number two, um, the uvula blocks the oropharynx. So the uvula, does it block the oropharynx? It blocks the nasopharynx, right. So it blocks things from going up into the nose. The oropharynx is right behind the mouth. You want the food to go through that passageway. How about number three, the vocal cords close and seal off the trachea. That one looks pretty true, right? Where are the vocal cords? What's the structure that they're located in? The larynx. Yeah, the larynx sits at the top of the trachea and it blocks things from going down in. And number four, the tongue presses down on the floor of the oral cavity. True or false? False. What's the tongue do? Pushes up on the roof of the oral cavity, right? So number three is our correct answer. This is the only thing that actually happens. Next organ, the stomach. So esophagus was pretty simple. Stomach. Here you have the gastroesophageal sphincter. What was the C word for that sphincter? Cardiac sphincter or the lower esophageal sphincter, all the same stuff. When you look at the an anatomy of the stomach, the top part is the fundus, the middle section for storage is the body, and the antrum, the lower areas where you do most of the food processing. So the fundus is the entry top part, the body's for storage, and then the antrum's for processing. I always remember, fundus is like the trickiest part. But I always remember the funnest at the top because it's like a roller coaster. It's always funnest at the top. You guys are a lot of fun. Even my lame jokes don't work on you. It's the same thing when you're talking about the uterus. So the funnest is the top area. The funnest is always located at the top of the organ. Just like the fun part of the roller coaster. Funnest at the top. All right, and then the pyloric sphincter is all the way at the end. So the antrum is this, cat, uh, this area, but the pyloric region is the very end of the antrum body for storage, antrum for processing, and then the pyloric sphincter opens up just a little bit to let a little bit of food squirt through. 
a little bit at a time. When you eat a sandwich, you store most of it in the body for up to four hours, and then it's slowly smashed, processed, and then liquidy, it's called chyme now. It's no longer a bolus, it's called chyme. That little chyme is squished through about a tablespoon at a time, just like the size of your thumb. Squirt. But you have to process it. You have The stomach's there for storage so that we don't have to graze constantly. We can eat food and store it for hours. And the other thing is to help liquefy that food so it's ready for the small intestines to handle it. The stomach's thick and dense and powerful and strong. The small intestine is actually really delicate in aligning. It's not nearly as strong as the stomach. Okay, so the stomach serves the mixing chamber and a storage area for the food. Like I said, for about four hours you'll store it. Depending on a couple factors which we'll talk about, the more liquidy food is, the faster it moves through the stomach. So if you eat food that's already highly processed, it doesn't stay in your stomach for very long at all. If you eat something that's really liquidy, it doesn't stay in your stomach for very long. It's like when you go to a Chinese restaurant and you're eating that highly processed food that's very liquidy because they usually boil it in things and then they put enzymes in it to help break it down. That's why as soon as you eat Chinese food, it's like you have... It goes out of your stomach, and how do you feel a half hour later? Hungry again, right? It shoots right through you. And then the rugae are the little folds inside. The rugae are actually there to increase volume. When we talk about the small intestine folds, the circular folds are totally different than these folds. These are like folds like you fold up a shirt to save space, right? And then when you're ready to use it, you just open it up. It's the same thing with the stomach. These rugae are folds that squeeze in to stay save space, but as you fill the stomach, they start stretching out. They allow it to increase volume. And then we already talked about the four main regions, so you're all taken care of there. And then there's just another dissected picture of the stomach. Up here you see the cardiac region, which is where the cardiac sphincter is at. You can see three layers of muscle, which is unique for the stomach compared to the rest of the GI tract. It's all smooth muscle too, you have no control over it. But you have the circular layer that goes around it, like we were talking about before. You have the longitudinal that goes to the length of it to help propel things, but you also have the oblique layer that goes at an angle. And it's so that when you're squeezing food, you can squeeze it up and down, you can squeeze it sideways, and you can also squeeze it at an angle. You're massively crunching and smashing the food in the stomach. It's almost like if you took the ingredients for cookies, you take the egg, you take the flour, you take the baking powder, all that stuff, you put it all in a Ziploc bag. Can you mix it once it's all just thrown in the Ziploc bag? What do you do? You just smash one side of the bag to the next. You just keep smashing it back and forth, right? And you can mix it. That's what the stomach does. It takes that food, just starts grinding it in that sac, which is the stomach, until it's all smushed up and liquidy. And the more you work it, the more liquidy it gets. Right? So you have these three directions that you can smash in. And then eventually, out through the pyloric sphincter, you push it in the small intestine. Right. They're the same four layers we talked about before. So what do you call the inner layer of the stomach, the stuff that touches the food? Your mucosa. You secrete mucus. You're going to secrete some enzymes like hydrochloric acid, some enzymes like something called pepsin that breaks down prote proteins. Underneath it's the submucosa, and you can see the submucosa with all of its blood vessels, its lymphatics. And then the muscularis, and there are three layers. One, two, three. And they try and draw this so that you can see this kind of goes at one angle. This one's coming straight at you. And the third one's going the length of the picture. And the outer layer, the serosa, is there to help allow the stomach to kind of shift and move. And again, when you took apart the human or you took apart a cat, whatever you dissected in anatomy, you could see that once you had the abdominal cavity op open, things could just slide around. And if you started pushing on it, they just shifted over each other because the serosa allows that, that movement. All right, so the stomach's main functions, storing food, I've mentioned this like three times. So you can store things for like four hours. The more dense the food is, the longer it takes. The more fatty the food is, the longer it takes. So like when you eat bacon at breakfast, it's a really dense material. It's high protein and high fat. It's like going to stay the longest in your stomach. It stays in there forever, it seems like. That carrot, so you ever notice that there's always a carrot in your stomach? Anytime you vomit, there's a carrot. doesn't matter if you ate a carrot last month. right? There it is. And hot dogs, right? If you ever want to eat, laugh your butt off, um, Google Jim Brewer's, I, I don't know, Jim Brewer's a comedian, he talks about alcohol, and he actually says that in one of his stand-up comedy bits about alcohol. Is it never fails. There's always a hot dog in there, right? When you vomit. Number two, secretes hydrochloric acid and enzymes. I just mentioned that. It's to help break down the food. So this is a step in digestion. 
and then it produces this stuff called chyme. What was it before it was chyme? It was called a bolus, yep. So the thick bolus that you swallow, once it's introduced to stomach acids and stomach enzymes and liquids in the stomach, now it's chyme. It's really liquidy. It's gooey and nasty. All right. So now we're going to talk about motility. Remember, there's four processes. Motility. First thing you're going to do is gastric filling. You're filling the stomach and it stretches from 50 milliliters, so a couple shot glasses in size, all the way up to about a liter safely or comfortably. You can actually train your stomach to get bigger than that. Like the little, who was, it was a little Asian guy a couple years ago that ate, what was it, like 100 hot dogs or something like that? Insane. How did, how did that little guy fit that in there? It just baffles me. And how's he getting it out? It baffles me even more. So, whew, pushing hot dogs through your GI tract can't be good. But 50, 50 milliliters up to a whole liter. And we call it receptive relaxation because if you slowly fill the stomach, it slowly expands. If you quickly fill it, what's it do? So if you take um, milk and you start chugging it, and all those proteins in milk turn into one massive wad, it forcefully expels it. So the gastric filling receptively relaxes if you slowly fill it. I knew somebody that ate like four cinnamon rolls, big cinnamon rolls, and she ate them way too fast and in her stomach. They started just turning into one massive wad of dough and she actually vomited the whole thing back up as one big big doughy cinnamon roll. Yeah, awesome. I wonder if you could recook that. <laughs> kidding. Totally kidding. But really, could you? Number two, gastric body, of course, is going to be there for storage and then the antrums for mixing. The final step, the emptying, like I said before, liquids empty faster. So if you, and you know this because if you drink water, the water will shoot straight through you. Next thing you know, in 15 minutes, you're starting to pee, right? Because you have too much water. But if you eat something that's thick and dense, it'll stay in there for a long time. You're just like, ugh. Hours later, you still feel uncomfortable. The more liquidy it is, the easier it moves. So those are some principles. And here's what it looks like. I always think of it like a blender. So here are that big open area of the blender, and down here's where you're doing the processing, right? So you put the food in here. Um, like this morning, I actually threw some apples and some spinach and everything in a blender. And when you turn it on, what happens down at the bottom? It starts turning to liquid, but you still see those huge chunks in the top, right? Your stomach works the same way. The big chunks step here, and it slowly starts pulling the chunks down, and they go, and they turn into liquid. And what's interesting is that if they're not liquidy enough, they will start circulating back around and grabbing more food and bring it back down, processing it, until all of this is one big liquidy material. Hopefully you can visualize what I'm talking about. You know that when you use a blender, the bottom stuff's like all liquidy, but the top still has a thick chunk, so you kind of shake the blender, and it starts slowly circulating the liquid back up and sucking the big chunks down, and that's what the stomach does. It just keeps recirculating the stuff up here and then pulling the bigger chunks down until finally the most liquidy part that's right here at the very bottom will be pulled in. It's like this. The pyrex sphincter opens up and it pulls like a tablespoon of stuff in. This is the most liquidy wet stuff. This is highly processed, so it's ideal for the small intestine. And then it just closes again and recirculates until this stuff's liquidy enough. And then it opens again and brings it in. And then recirculates. And then opens and brings it in over and over and over again. So you've got the propulsive stage, the propelling, which is a peristaltic contraction. It's squeezing that stuff in just like your esophagus did. But then you have the mixing stage where you're constantly recirculating the stuff up to try and make it more liquidy. Right? Two factors that control the stomach's rate of emptying. It's important to look at what's controlling the emptying. It says the stomach controlling the stomach. So stomach controlling gastric emptying. Would that be an extrinsic or an intrinsic store? controller to the stomach. Intrinsic, it's the stomach controlling the stomach. So the stomach has kind of the ultimate say in what's going on here. If you put a lot of stuff that's like a lot of substance in the stomach, the stomach is going to start moving faster. It doesn't, I didn't say it necessarily moves downward faster. What could it do? Push it right back up and make you vomit, right? So if you start putting a lot of volume in here, you're either going to have to start pushing it down quicker because the stomach's going to start moving faster or you're going to have to vomit back up. High volume increases motility is what you want to have in here somewhere. High volume increases motility of the stomach. The stomach squeezes harder, squeezes faster, starts propelling quicker. So if you know that, if you know high volume increases motility, what's low volume do? Slows it down. It's a more general contraction, a slower contraction. The second thing is that the stomach determines how liquidy the substance is. 
So if you have highly fluid substance, what's going to happen to the stomach? Will it push it slower or will it push it faster to the next organ? Faster. The whole goal of the stomach here is to store and liquefy. Once it's liquefied, it's going to push it on. So the more fluid the substance is, the faster it moves through your system. So if you're going out on Friday night, or tonight, I guess, if tonight's your Friday, and you're going to a bar and you haven't eaten anything, and you drink alcohol, what do you know happens? It leaves your stomach quickly, goes to your small intestine, and gets sucked right into your blood. So what do you do to try and slow that down? You eat thick substances to mix with the alcohol to make it thicker to slow the stomach's emptying. See how, see how important physiology is? You can actually apply it on Friday nights. And it's even better when you tell your friends. And they're like, man, you know I should eat something before I drink. And you should say, actually, you know why that is? Because the more fluid things are, the faster they move through your, your tract. Putting food in there like fatty substances, acidic substances, thick substances, which are hypertonic substances, will slow it down. So the next factor is the duodenal influence over the gastric emptying. Now it's the small intestine talking to the stomach and saying, I don't want you to dump stuff into me, right? So if you're pushing things into the small intestine too fat, too fast, too fast, like if it's too fatty, fat is really hard to process for your small intestine. So if your stomach's pushing a lot of fat in there, what's the small intestine going to tell the stomach? Slow down, man. I can't process all this stuff this quickly. If you have lots of acid in your stomach and you push that acid into the small intestine, the pH of the small intestine is a little bit basic. It's not acidic at all. If you start pushing too much acid in there, what could happen to your small intestine? It's used to being basic, and if you start dumping acid in there, when the most toxic acids, that you're, actually the most toxic acid your body makes, hydrochloric acid, it would destroy your small intestine. So what's the small intestine going to tell your stomach? Slow down so I can neutralize this acid before you introduce more. And then hypertonicity means lots of solute. In other words, lots of protein, lots of thick substance. Things that are thick and bulky. Like if you eat a big steak that's really, you know, a lean steak that's high in protein, that's a very hypertonic substance. It's going to... You put that in the, in the small intestine, it's going to tell the stomach, slow down. I can't process this thick stuff very well. So all three of these things are going to slow down gastric emptying. These two things speed up emptying. These three things slow down. Here's the stomach saying, okay, I have too much food. I have too much liquid. I'm going to get rid of it. Here you have the small intestine that's receiving that stuff, saying this is too fatty. This is too acidic. This is too thick. I can't process it. So when you go out to the bar, ideally what you want to eat to slow down the, absor the absorption of alcohol is something that's very fatty, very acidic, or very thick. So what do they usually serve you? Greasy, nasty, high protein food, right? So deep fried anything, deep fried hot dog, deep fried hamburger, deep fried whatever. They're getting as much fat in you and they, I don't think they knew their physiology when they came up with this. They just figured out when you eat fatty stuff, you have a tendency to do what? drink more, right? Because you're not feeling the effect of the alcohol. Does that mean it's never going to hit you? No, it just takes a little longer, right? So don't make it a competition to see how much fatty crap you can eat and how much alcohol you can drink and still be able to walk a straight line. It'll get you. It'll catch up to you. All right, so these are the GI tract controlling it. Actually, I'm going to skip to the next slide and then come back to this question. The last thing that controls the GI tract is the brain, right? So now you have the stomach controlling the stomach, you have the duodenum controlling the stomach, and now you have the brain controlling the stomach. Things like emotion controls gastric emptying. Sadness slows down motility. Anger speeds it up. And it's funny because it actually affects the entire GI tract like this. If you're sad, you actually have a higher chance of becoming constipated. So if you're walking along some time and say, oh, you must be sad because you really look constipated. <laughs> or you you seem really sad. Do you need a laxative? That'll perk one end up. And this anger is just the opposite. I always think I'm so angry I could spit. If you just change one letter, it always makes me remember. Anger speeds things up, right? You feel so angry. You can almost feel your like, stomach rumbling. You get so angry. 
oh, I'm so angry. I gotta go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. <laughs> but emotion can affect your GI emptying. You ever felt so angry you could vomit? Right? When it's so intense, sometimes it actually does that. It speeds up the stomach so much, but if the stomach can't push it down, it wants to push it back up. Intense pain is another one. So intense pain will actually slow down the GI tract. People that are in a lot of pain, it slows their GI tract down. Like people with chronic pain, they get constipated a lot, which doesn't help because then that's an uncomfortable feeling too. And then number three, decreased glucose utilization in the brain. If your brain doesn't need the sugar, it will slow down the GI tract, the stomach specifically. It's saying, you know what, I don't need that sugar now, do what with it? Just hold on to it, exactly. Store it a little bit longer. When we're ready for it, then I'll tell you. So if you're not using the sugar very fast in the brain, it actually slows the movement through the GI tract. Right? And then here's your disorder associated with the stomach vomiting. So contraction, of the, here's how it works. Contraction of the diaphragm, and I talked about this before. Remember the diaphragm for breathing you can also contract the diaphragm and smash the stomach, right? So not only does it lengthen the lungs, it actually compresses everything in the GI tract. So if you squeeze the anal sphincter and you compress the diaphragm, that stomach's gonna get smashed and you can't push things downward because the sphincters are closing, but you can pull, force it up and back out. Right? The abdominal muscles start compressing, same idea. They're squeezing in, compressing the stomach, trying to push the food upwards. It starts because of the vomiting center in the medulla, so the medulla oblongata. If, it's, if it senses some kind of a trigger in your passageway for food and air, it'll tell you to vomit. If it um, senses something like it's a chemical irritant, like syrup of Epicac, when I was a kid, I had a friend that got a hold of a bottle of that. Anytime he wanted a sick day, he knew exactly what to do, right? None of that putting the thermometer over the light bulb and all that, he'd just take a little syrup of Epicac and vomit, and his mom started going, oh, you better stay home today. Golden. Brilliant bastard. I wish I was that smart. They don't, I don't think you can buy that over the counter anymore. I think you actually have to get a prescription for, for it. Does anybody not know what syrup of Epicac is? It's something that induces vom vomiting. It's such, it's such an irritating chemical that when it gets into your stomach, it just irritates the lining and makes you want to vomit it back up. So, yeah. So that kid was way ahead of his time. He's in jail now, by the way. Uh, he's in prison. He was my best buddy right across the street from me. It was it was weird when it happened too, because I was back home and his face was with his orange jumpsuit was on the street. And I went, oh shit! Right? It's just weird seeing somebody you grew up with having that situation. I get away with crime. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Totally kidding. Um, anyway, and then the causes, touching the back of the throat, irritation or descending the stomach. So, like I said, with that whole milk gallon chug, increasing intracranial pressure. If you start compressing the medulla oblongata, it starts doing crazy stuff. You might start hiccuping, you might start vomiting, you might start breathing irregularly. All the things that the medulla oblongata does, it's almost like it's over-firing and doing all these weird things. So if you smash the medulla, it will start vomiting first, and then when it finally gets smashed so it can't work, what happens to you? You get dead. Okay, rotation, acceleration of the head, sending these mixed signals from the vestibular apparatus going down the brainstem, and you just get really confused, and you're disoriented, and then woof, signals are going crazy through the brainstem. And then chemical agents like syrup of epicac, and psychogenic vomiting, I love this. I always picture Dumb and Dumber, where Lloyd sees hair, or is it the other way around? Which one's Jim Carrey? Nobody's seen that movie, huh? Is it Lloyd, Lloyd Christmas, I think? So he sees Harry kissing Mary, and he's like, oh, <laughs> that emotional vomiting, that psychogenic vomiting where he looks like he's going to vomit but doesn't actually do it. And then emotions right along with that, too. You're, oh, psychogenic's another beautiful one. Anybody here vomit when they see vomit? When they see people vomiting? There's your psychogenic. There's no good reason for that. It's all in your head. So you should just, immersion therapy, just be around a lot of people vomiting, and you'll get over that after you vomit all over them like 20 times. And effects. So here are the bad outcomes of vomiting, other than being disgusting and having to clean that spaghetti off the wall, right? So number one is you're losing fluids, which causes dehydration. Remember, all the things that you secrete in the stomach are borrowed from where? The plasma, the blood. So when you lose water from the stomach, your blood will say, all right, I'll give you a little bit more. 
Hang on to it this time. And then you lose more of it, right? What's the blood say? I'll give you a little bit more. Until the blood's so thin on water, you become dehydrated. It's going to start sucking water out of the cells of your body, and your whole body becomes dehydrated as a result. Your brain gets dehydrated, and then you can potentially die. So loss of fluids for dehydration. And then metabolic alkalosis. What are you losing from the stomach when you vomit? Stomach acid. This is, this is an easy concept that people get really easily confused. If you have acid that you borrowed from where? The blood, the plasma, right? So your plasma loans stomach acid, basically, to the stomach. And then the stomach throws it away. And then the blood gives more stomach acid. And then the stomach throws it away. You're losing acids. Your body has a perfect balance of acid and base. If you're constantly losing acid, what becomes dominant in the blood? Base. You get something called metabolic alkalosis. Base is alkaline. So you become too basic, and that can actually kill you too. This is an important concept, and we'll talk about acids and bases again over and over again. Like when we talk about um, diarrhea, it's just the opposite of this. From the stomach, you lose stomach acid, which means your body becomes too basic. From the other end, you lose too many bases, which means your blood becomes too acidic. Whichever one's more powerful or more abundant, that's the winner. So the big effects of vomiting is that you lose fluids and you become too alkaline. Oops, I skipped over a question, didn't I? All right, we'll do this question and that other one. We have just enough time for those two questions. So first, excessive amounts of vomiting can cause what? Well, let's go for volume overload or dehydration? Dehydration, because you're losing fluids. And then, so it has to be one or two. What else are you losing? You're losing acids, so what stays in your body? Alkaline is the base. So number two is our right answer. Let me go back to that. There we go. So what factor would increase the rate of gastric emptying? What's one thing that would make your stomach go faster? One factor that would increase the rate of gastric emptying. How about just a little bit of food in the stomach? Would that make it go faster or slower? It makes it go slower. How about fat in the small intestine? That would make it go slower. How about acid in the small intestine? That would make it go slower. Remember fats, acids, high proteins? All those things in the small intestine that can't process them very well, so it's going to tell us something to slow down. So those first three slow things down. How about putting a lot of food in the stomach? Will that speed it up or slow it down? That definitely speeds it up. It's either going to speed up and push it into the small intestine, or it's going to speed it up and make it vomit back out. So number four is the correct answer. And that's it. I will see you on Tuesday. Bring your textbook Tuesday to class, by the way. I'm going to give you some study tips on Tuesday. What? Study tips on Tuesday. Yeah, bring your textbook and I'll go through some study tips on Tuesday.